last year, I was prepping for a class that I'm going to be teaching in May that is inspired by a fragment of the Baldeschal tapestry from Norway. And as I was working through the process of designing that class and road testing it with a handful of students, I really got interested in what is happening in this piece? What is the story? And there begat the rabbit hole, or at this point, I'm pretty sure it's a prairie dog village <laughs> instead of just a rabbit hole. And I want to take you on that journey because what I found may end up being a bit outside of the box of what you've heard before about this piece. First, I want to bring some context for where the Baldeschal tapestry sits within the greater history of European pictorial tapestry. Some of the earliest surviving examples that we have are from the Byzantine period. And like these two fragments here, they're usually not in the best of shape. And they're fairly small tapestries, things that you would probably put on a pillow or a cushion to adorn your home. But from them, we get the, the birth of this pictorial style of tapestry that starts to spread across Europe, both for religious and secular environments. After the Byzantine style of tapestry, we move into the Romanesque style of tapestry. So the Romanesque period, this is early Middle Ages. It's uh, the architecture is rounded arches. There's a lot of church building that's going on and abbeys and tapestries in these new stone structures becomes a big way to add color and add sumptuousness. And we're starting to see tapestry production as an industry begin to pop up in a variety of places. But when historians say, we don't have very many surviving examples of tapestry from this period, that is the understatement of the era, because there's like seven. All the rest are in a church in Germany. And then there's the Baldeschal tapestry. These are some of the German examples. After the Romanesque period, as we get into the high Middle Ages, then tapestry changes into what is called the Gothic period. This is where we start to see immense pieces of epic proportion, things like uh, the, the series on the right, which lives in France, and it uh, depicts the entire book of Revelations. There were originally 100 pieces, and they're massive, 80 some have survived. And the one on the left is Swiss, and we get this deep storytelling layered, and there's word bubble texts, and we start to see the work get finer. Things are becoming much more naturalistic. The art is changing in its style, as is architecture with the Gothic arches, and ceilings get a lot taller, and we get to stained glass, and that whole period. And from there, tapestry moves into the late medieval period, which is my personal favorite era. <laughs> my students have heard me talk a lot about this era in tapestry, the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, where tapestry is still hanging on to being the preeminent luxury good art form before it's superseded by painting in the Italian Renaissance. And we get this extreme naturalism and the storytelling layers just keep building and building and the symbolism. And it's just very delicious what you can find in that era. And then we have the Baldeschal tapestry fragment. It is not a full tapestry. And we'll go into what may have been the rest of it. And this lives at the National Museum in Oslo in Norway. It is from that Romanesque period, the early middle, medieval period. The most recent scholarship dates it to the late 1100s. So that's like a hundred years after the Norman conquest of England, about in there. So let's get up a little closer than that image so that we can see what has survived of this fragment. 
And we have two scenes, and you can see the Romanesque round arches that frame the scenes. We've got this lovely acanthus scroll at the bottom and the, the rounded swiggles in green and white at the top. That's called running hounds, that particular motif. And we have two guys. We've got one who's hanging out with some birds, and we've got another one who's obviously a soldier of some ilk on a horse, a very male horse. Sorry about that, but that was considered important at the time. And a lot of the scholarship that you will find on this tapestry focuses on the soldier and his kit and what he's wearing and what that says about being a soldier at that time. So because that is a really well-trodden path already, I will leave that to the people where that is their subject. And I like to focus on the guy with the birds. Because when you read in the, the sources, they well, we have we have a lover who is dressed very handsomely, and we have these birds. And they really don't go any further than that, other than, well, is he throwing seeds to them or what's going on? So that's the rabbit hole we're going to go chase. It's important to understand the environment the tapestry lived in at this era. So whether it was living in a wood structure or it was living in a stone structure, the idea was to bring color inside. There weren't a lot of windows in buildings in the Romanesque period, and they tended to be really small because of structural issues that were later conquered with Gothic architecture, but we hadn't gotten there yet. And the idea was to bring summer inside. The idea was to brighten the space, warm the space considerably. If you're going to have a big wool piece on the wall, it adds a lot of warmth. And they were meant to tell stories. If you couldn't afford a tapestry, you might paint fabric and hang that up. And if you couldn't afford that, you might paint directly on the wall. And we can see different versions of that here. And while we know that there was a lot of tapestry production going to the aristocracy, in this period, none of it has survived. And part of that has to do with the aristocracy tends to chase fashion and fashion changes. And then so you've got this old thing that you've had for a while and then it goes into the rag bin and then it's gone. Or this group raids that group, they sack their place and it's also gone. The oldest surviving pieces have all survived in churches because they were a more stable environment where things like that had a chance to live longer. And the reason that the Baldashal tapestry is even called the Baldashal tapestry is because it was found in the Baldashal church, for which there are no surviving photos, but I did drill in and find this charcoal sketch, which was made just before it came down. And it came down in the late 1800s. And this is sort of north of Oslo is where the Baldeshal church was. This was built in the 1600s. And by the late 1800s, it was in bad shape. And the members of the church decided they were going to build a new church further down the road that was stone. And this one was coming down. And in order to help pay for the new church, they decided to dismantle everything and have a great big auction to sell what they could to raise money. And as they were dismantling this thing, from under the floorboards, they found this rolled up rag, totally coated in clay. And the people pulling it apart were kind of like, ew. And it really just went into the storage in an attic in a farmhouse nearby. And it got ignored for another 10 years until a lady was visiting who knew what she was looking at and washed it and went, I got to get this to the National Museum right away. Because it wasn't just a rag. It was a fragment of a very old tapestry. And this is the new church that was built further down the road, road that is Baldashal Church today. The 
floorboards under which it was were constructed in the 1600s. The tapestry was woven in the late 1100s. So there had to have been another church before the wood one. I was not able to scrounge up evidence of exactly what that would have been, but I was able to look around at other regional churches and try to get a sense of two main ways it may have been. And one was it could have been an older wooden church, potentially in the stave style. And I love the interior photo of the one I found on the left because look carefully at how it's painted. And here along the lower edge, it's painted like they've draped fabric. That gives us really interesting evidence where if there had been a band of tapestry, that's where you would have put it. Alternately, it could have been a stone church that was smaller that simply wasn't able to accommodate the size of the congregation as populations grew. And this is a stone church, Balke um, Kirk, I hope I'm saying that close to right, that is in the same bishopric as the Baldashal. So it offers us a glimpse into some of the stone style architecture from the 1100s or the late 10 hundreds that helps us see how churches were being built in the era that the Baldashal would have been made. And I love some of the quirky bits like here where the cutout for the window <laughs> is irregular and they've managed to save that in the architectural drawing. And then I went in search of what do these little stone older churches look like on the inside. And does that give us any insight into where you might display a tapestry? And the style of arrangement of the tapestry is in what's called a frieze. So it's a long, narrow piece that you would wrap around, whether it's multiple panels that you put end to end or one great big long one, depending on the loom and what the weaver could do. It's very likely it was arranged similarly to how it was painted in the wooden church. Now I want to bridge to what the subject is. And the subject is the labors of the months, which interestingly is a really common art to have on churches, especially on the carved arches as you come inside. They're usually an agricultural theme. They may be carved, or here we also have stained glass. And it was to represent every month's theme. And I found some interesting both historic calendars and a more contemporary one that helps us understand what was happening when in the different months in the agricultural cycle. And interestingly, that also gets paired with the astronomical signs for those months. And we'll circle back to that. We do have evidence of the labors of the months being in other textiles. The piece on the right is an embroidery that lives in a cathedral in Spain, which roughly dates pretty close to when the Baldashaw was made. And we also have interesting traditions in Scandinavia called the Prinstav. And I believe that there are several in the Vesterheim collection as well. One side is summer and one side is winter. And on it is marked what happens when in the agricultural and fiber shed cycle. So you knew when to plant this, you knew when to harvest that, you knew when to shear the sheep and you could keep track. Because in the 1100s, they didn't have a paper calendar or a smartphone to help them know uh, what day they were on. They had this other system. And the labors of the months, while they have slightly different themes in different art forms, because I went looking through all different styles from this era and later because it was a very stable art condition. They're always agricultural except for two months 
that being April and May. Now, sometimes they were agricultural too, but if any of them were non-agricultural, it was April and it was May. And April was the lovers. And May was either hunting, hawking, or war. Very not commonly war. Usually hawking and hunting. Something on horseback that only the elite were allowed to do. And then we jump right back into the agricultural part. Here's a few others that show us agriculture, agriculture, agriculture. And then April, we've got the lover and a tree with he's holding some flowers and rushes. And May, we have the guy, he's got the hawk on his hand and he's got a special tool that he uses to train the hawk with. And then we jump right back into agricultural themes. Hang on to that because we're going to double back. The labors of the months in tapestry is not specific only to the Baldeschal. I did find a later era example in Germany. So this is also a frieze. You can see it's very long and narrow that shows the labors of the month in tapestry form. And it is pretty much all agricultural themes in this one. You can see there's a lot of planting and then there's harvesting and then there's butchering, all important pieces to keeping everyone alive and fed in the medieval world. I have to say that my favorite Labors of the Month piece of art has to be the Book of Hours because the illustrations are just so delicious. And if you follow the calendar along, here's April with the lovers and here's May and they're doing a promenade and all of the nobility are very handsomely dressed for that escapade. But I want you to look at what is on the top of these images. We have constellation and zodiac images telling us, and that month, this much we're in Pisces and that much we're in the next one, so that people could follow it with the stars. So let's hive off just April from the Book of Hours and another version of April from a later woodcut. And what we find is, so April, we start in Aries and then we change to Taurus. And on that one, they're living on the top in that arch. But on the one on the right where the illustrator is stuck having to fit everything in this rectangle, They've put Aries in a circle here and Taurus in a circle there and just sort of shoved them into the image where there was a blank spot. But the message is still there that the sky is like this and then it changes to that within this month. And that's how you know that you're in that month. How... The zodiac signs were depicted in the medieval world is a little different than how we're used to seeing them depicted today. And I loved finding the illumination at right, which brought them all together from a roughly contemporary standpoint to when the Baldeshaw was created. I'm not sure what has happened to cancer. It's creeping me out, but okay, maybe you've just never seen a crab and we'll just move on. And the two images that left, I was looking at what does the night sky look like in Norway in April and May? So you can see where those constellations are hanging out in the sky for the people living in those times um, in that place. So that's the moving up from Aries to Taurus and then Taurus to Gemini for those months. So if you go, okay, Aries to Taurus, Taurus to Gemini, how does that imagery tend to get portrayed in Scandinavian forms? And I had previously done some interesting research into uh, symbols in textiles in Scandinavia from the Viking age to present. And I had been keeping a journal of some of the forms. And I went back to that journal to see different representations of horns, because two of our characters have horns, Aries and Taurus, and how ox horns and ram horns 
tend to get portrayed in textiles as a symbolic form that other people would, from the same culture, would have known how to read because they're used to seeing that. It shows up in bridal textiles. It shows up in later in mittens and it's everywhere. So I want to bring you back to the tapestry. And I want to invite you to think about how this was on the loom, because how it is now is not how it was on the loom. You would take the whole thing and tip it 90 degrees because your loom could only be built so wide or the wood is going to warp. And the warp threads, you can see them sticking out at the ends. Those would have been going up and down. So the weaver is looking at this thing sideways as it's being made. And there are certain shapes that are much more easy to weave one way on the loom and would be ridiculously hard to weave on the other way on the loom. That's why the birds look sideways. Because if you switched them 90 degrees, it would be really hard to weave them like that. So I can already see that the weaver is willing to move shapes in order to make them more weavable. So I want to invite you to tip your head to the, so your left ear is down and your right ear is up. And I want to come over to this shape with these curls. And I want you to think of that as potentially being horns and this being the face and a nose of a ram. And then we're going to come to this one and you see we've got these longer horn shapes and a longer face potentially of the bull of the Taurus. And we've got another one of those over here. There's more length of Taurus in April than Aries. Aries is one third, Taurus is two thirds. And then we move over here. Here's another potential Taurus in here. And then over here, we've got this two coming into one shape. Anyone else see that that might be Gemini? So all these little shapes that are dotted in amongst here, they are not accidents. There are not accidents in tapestry. Everything is exceedingly purposeful and it's meant to tell a story. We can learn a little bit about how that storytelling works from another textile, which gets called a tapestry. It's actually an embroidery. It is the Bayou tapestry that is housed in Bayou, France. It was made in England by Canterbury nuns for the Bishop of Bayou, who also happened to become the Earl of Kent because his half-brother was William the Conqueror. And it is a publicity stunt in which he is explaining why we should have gone to England and taken it. But it has some of the most similar visual iconography to the Baldashal tapestry in surviving textile form that we have, even though it was made roughly 100 years earlier. And some of the fun things to find in there is not only do we have something really close to our soldier on his horse, but we also have like the man in the long split tunic, only here he's handing out roasted chickens instead of hanging out with birds. I do wanna give you a sense of what tapestry production may have looked like in this era. It would have been an upright loom, much like the one on the right. The weaver would have been working on the back of the piece and they would have used these, this is holding mirrors here for them to see what they're doing is producing on the front side and they could have moved it on rollers. So were all 12 of the months, even though two have survived there or was it maybe two months at a time or four months at a time that were lined up? That is going to be hard for us to ever know. Pictures at the left were taken in Turkey in the 1940s, but it could have been the Middle Ages. It really is the exact same technology with these big, long levers and everything is tied with ropes. I want to put a shout out 
to fellow tapestry weaver and instructor Robbie Lafleur. She got to go to Oslo this last summer, right after the Baldeshal had received some special reconstruction work and had just been put back out on public display. And she took some amazing up close photos. It was so hard for me to get photos with enough detail that I could do things as geeky as like count how many warps <laughs> something was. And she gave me special permission to use that in today's program. So these are some of her images. And we can really get in there and see some of the choices that the weaver was making. I was especially hanging out with the choices with the birds in preparation for the Baldashal bird class, looking at techniques like cutbacks and eccentric weft and noticing how warps were getting distorted because of choices that the weaver had made. It really felt like I could step into that weaving experience and see, oh yes, that's why they put the bird on its side because it is more weavable that way. To switch it would have turned it into a nightmare. And in that class, if you're interested, or maybe some of you who are here today are already signed up, we look at where those different techniques live, whether it's intricate dovetail joins in the orange, eccentric weft in the pink, cutbacks, which allow you to focus on just one area at a time in the blue. And we get to reproduce that experience on our loom at scale at the same number of warps per inch as the original. I was also interested in chasing what the colors would have looked like originally because the medieval palette was bright, bright, bright. You wanted to bring those colors inside. You wanted to bring summer inside. Reds were ridiculously intense as were yellows. And the white is very intense in the Baldashal because it's the only part that wasn't wool. It's bleached linen. So we'll play with that as well. Like all Romanesque tapestries that have survived, the Baldashal uses a really intricate joins method for anything that gets a little bit more vertical called pointed dovetailing. And in the test run of the class, we did a lot of fun experimenting to try to figure out exactly what, how many turns, and then you move over one and then you come back to try to mimic exactly what we were seeing and replicate that on our loom. And these joins take a bit of practice. They're not necessarily terribly straightforward, but it, it was magical to feel like we could do with our hands the same thing that Weaver was doing in the late 1100s. And guess what? We ran into the exact same problems on our loom that we ran into as well. But it was, it was such a magical journey. It's going to be so fun to share that again. And here you can see some of those joins playing out. It's a fairly strong join, and it makes it so you do not have to sew slits together when you're done. The slit sewing became much more popular in the Gothic and late medieval styles. But in the Romanesque period, meh -eh, they didn't want to sew any slits. Not that I can blame them. It's really boring. So I'm spending more time with the month of April, the lover. Which is interesting because in all of the stories and ballads that have survived, May is said to be the month of lovers. But a lot of those come out of the 14 and 1500s. And if you'll remember from the Wise and Foolish Virgins webinar, that's when we had major climate change. Things were a lot colder. So it's very likely in the warm period in the 1100s that the weather that was later in May was actually in April. Hence, April being the month for lovers. But what is that thing he's standing next to that the birds are on? And it is a tree. They had a different way of depicting trees in the 1100s. We'll just put it that way. So here from the Bayou Tapestry, we have trees, which in that textile denote a new scene. If you've got a tree, end of old scene, we're moving on to something else. And here we have a hunt of the unicorn uh, illumination. And we've also got some of these really interesting trees. And it was fun to replicate those 
some of that viney tree in our piece and these fleur de lis style leaves. And it just got me wondering, I'm like, what kind of a tree is this? I want to invite you that the medieval understanding of what is a tree is not the current biology understanding. We can see this as evidenced in things like ancient languages. Um, Ogun uh, in the Celtic language has an alphabet system based on trees. Trees, holly is one of them. Ivy is one of them. And we can also get some interesting insight into that from old songs. The holly and the ivy, when they are both full grown of all the trees that are in the woods. Ivy was considered a tree. And the more that I looked into that symbolism, the more that I found that Ivy, to the medieval understanding, is very much associated with everlasting love. Hmm. It's put in the same scene with the lover. That is not a mistake. So then I went, okay, what kind of bird is this bird? Because it's not just a bird. It is a specific bird. You know, in medieval art, things are very specific. And that's because they have symbolic value. It is a visual storytelling language for an illiterate audience. But people would know this visual language. And I went hopping around on the internet to see where is, you know, common consensus on what kind of bird it is. And I got the craziest answers. And I went, no, 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 no. What on the bird is distinctive in the tapestry? Neck stripes and eye rings. Those are not necessarily easy to weave. They are there on purpose. And that drew me to the rock dove or the pigeon, which also has neck stripes and eye rings. Why would you have a dove? Well, doves were very important in medieval society. They were a food source. And every castle would keep a dove cot or a place where the doves would live and have nests and you could raid their eggs for food and you could eat the birds for food too. And sometimes they were used for messengers, hence the homing pigeon concept. They were considered an important part of the estate, just like keeping any other kind of livestock. And while today we associate a dove with peace, to the medieval understanding, the dove was associated with love and the lover. And we can find other representations of the dove in medieval art, especially through books that are called bestiaries, comes from the word beast, which are ridiculously hilarious to read because they are so not biologically correct. <laughs> it's like the panther hunts its prey with its sweet breath and that <laughs> brings the prey in. It's really quite entertaining. But the illustrations are great because they show us some of the distinctive features of eye rings and neck stripes. And here we also have the dove on the, one of these really strange trees. And then I found it in another ballad. Um, it's 10,000 miles and it's full of all kinds of very, very common love language. You know, the rocks may melt and the seas may burn. And it has this one verse. Don't you see the lonesome turtle dove? Sitting on yon ivy tree, she's weeping for her own true love, just as I weep for mine. And that's a shared European love language. People looking at that panel for April would have seen all of that in that era. So when we did our version, of course, we had to do the neck stripes and the eye ring in honor of that dove. And that's the finished piece. 
that we do as part of that project. And it is very likely that those are seeds in the background. And perhaps the lover has cast the seeds in order to bring the doves into the scene. And then I went back to the lover. And as you know, from the Wise and Foolish Version webinar, I'm interested in what characters are wearing. And I looked at this and I said, something about this is familiar, but I can't quite put my finger on it. And I could not find any scholarship on what he was wearing. So I went back to my friends at the Tudor Taylor, especially Dr. Jane Malcolm Davies. And I went, I'm trying to figure out what this guy's wearing. I think it's there. Can you confirm? There is a type of fur. And fur is a very status-oriented thing that you can wear in the medieval period. It is regulated. Who can wear which kinds of furs and where you can wear them and how much of them you can wear. And it's all regulated by what are called sumptuary laws, which are decreed by the king and every new king adds to it and they get really complicated by the time you get to the end of the Middle Ages. And depicting fur in art was considered really important because it was such a status thing. On the left, we have a lady whose cloak is lined in there. And I'll talk a bit more about exactly what that is. Here we have a man who has um, bare fur. We have a lady who has miniver, which is there, but it's just the bellies, <laughs> just the white part. And then we have ermine here. And this is another representation of miniver or miniver. So people learned how to read the depiction of fur in art because it was such a status. And there, sorry, it's a squirrel. It's a gray squirrel in Northern Europe that they would catch and skin. That sounds like quite a project and line them all up. And I found this illumination, this guy here, see he's got like this halo. He's supposed to be like really nice right now. He's cutting his bear lined cloak to give some to this poor guy who has one leg. And you can see the individual bellies and the little bits that hang down, that's the front legs of the squirrel. And we've even got some squirrel tails at the bottom. So it gives you a real sense of how this part is put together. And notice it's got these lozenge shapes because of the shape of the belly. So then I went, okay, those are art depictions. How else can I wrap my head around? Am I really looking at bear? So I both went to some reenactment uh, groups that I follow on social media, looking for members that have actual bear outfits, as well as how is there represented in heraldry, coats of arms? That is a stylized way. And the image in the middle is the classic way you represent there in heraldry, the laws and shape, blue and white. So hang on to that. Because once you see it, it starts popping up everywhere. And you see all these people who are wearing bear whether it's in paintings or it's in tapestry or it's in uh even in carvings you'll sometimes see they make a special note of what kind of fur you're using and there was definitely a status symbol as a commoner you were not wearing bear and this puts us in an interesting spot because the fur trade is being represented by wearing that much ver on that character for the lover. And before Europeans ran into North and Central America, the fur industry channeled through Norway and Russia. Norway was a huge part of the European fur trade industry pre-Columbian. And it made a lot of people in the burger class very wealthy in Norway because of the trade in furs. And furriers were a whole industry. They were separate from tailors. If you had an outfit that was lined in fur, you had the part made by the tailor and then it was sent off to the furrier and you had the fur part done and then it was brought back. So it was a huge industry.
and I want to want to go back one step because I think that those two months, April and May, which are likely the only two in the entire original series that were non-agricultural, give us the best window into who the patrons of that tapestry were. They were of a warrior class, hence the soldier on his horse, which is usually depicted as a hunter, not a soldier. And the fact that the lover is so obviously clad in a very expensive fur. If we're ever going to touch who commissioned this tapestry for the Baldashal Church, I would put my bet on it was a family very involved in the fur trade that also was in the warrior class. And they wanted to leave that mark. And as I was showing this to Loran earlier as we were prepping for the official run of this webinar, it stood out that that may be why the piece was removed and rolled up and stuck in the floorboards because it was considered later under um, Protestant religion versus when it was made, it would have been Catholic. But that was too presumptuous to put yourself in that piece. And so those two panels were removed. And stuck in the floorboards, which is why they survived at all. And all the other panels are gone. That's a little ironic, isn't it? So this brings us back to the two pieces of the two webinars, the Wise and Foolish Virgins on the left, a later era rabbit hole, and the Baldashal bird from the greater Baldashal tapestry on the right in their brilliant approximating original colors. And I hope you've enjoyed that little foray into an interdisciplinary look at what you can read in the visual language of that piece once you know how to decode it. Thank you so much, Laura. What a wonderful presentation. Um, we're gonna open up the floor to uh, questions. Please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Lorraine and I will go back and forth uh, with Laura to pose as many questions as we can. Real quick on um, the verifer, how do you spell that? V-A-I-R. Awesome. And if you want to learn more about how that was um, depicted in and used in textiles, do I have that book here still? Well, it would be um, the Tudor Taylor has a series of books that they published, and it's the one that's called The Queen's Servants that has all of the references and resources to see how there is represented in art and then how it is used um, in textiles and some of the rules around that. That's more of an English interpretation, but it would have been very similar uh, in, in Norway at that time. When you showed us the image of the weaver at the loom earlier in the presentation, uh, I think some of our audience members were a little surprised. They were expecting a warp-weighted loom, uh, the kind of loom that perhaps those warps were attached to rocks or other weights at the bottom. Could you comment on that for us? Sure. The warp-weighted loom represents some real technical challenges for tapestry because you typically push the work up. And tapestry has to be beaten with a certain amount of force in order for it to pack tightly enough to be tapestry. So while there are ways that you can tie it at the bottom and flip the warp over and weight it down at the back so that you can beat down, looms for tapestry production quickly changed how they were structured 
compared to a warp weighted and you got more of the scroll like technology and that was definitely in place for tapestry production in that particular era we didn't have the big guilds like the flemish guilds that we got in the later middle ages and high middle ages a lot of tapestry production was actually happening in monasteries so you might have a monastery make tapestries on a smaller scale for their church and for other churches. So it is entirely possible that the Baldeschal tapestry was made in Norway at a monastery. It's also entirely possible that it was made somewhere else and brought to Norway. And until we do isotope analysis on the fibers themselves to see where the sheep lived and ate, it's going to be harder for us to unravel that question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, how big is the Baldeschal tapestry, at least the fragment that we have? Great question. So it's about four feet tall. And each month, if we had the whole thing, because a little bit is missing, would have been about a yard, so three feet wide. So if you have all 12 months, that is 12 yards <laughs> of, of material to cover the wall. So it would have been a very significant series and it would have been all 12 months. The two months that remain would not have been the complete piece. They may have been their own panel, but it's very obvious that they've been unceremoniously cut. So I think that at least four months in a chunk was done on the loom, if not more, because you can move it on a roller and do a longer piece. All right, we've certainly had a lot of compliments in the chat, and we've also had the question about whether this will be available on video and let everybody know, yes, that's going to be the case. Everybody will get an email letting you know that this will be available in approximately a week on Vesterheim's YouTube channel. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is known about the dyes that were used on the Baldeschal tapestry? Sure. So at this point, everything is animal, vegetable, or mineral. Aniline dyes are not going to hit the scene until the 1860s. That's a long ways off. The typical way that dyes were made at this time is that madder was for red, yarrow was for yellow, woad or indigo, depending on what you could get, is for blue. The white, specific to this piece, which is rather unusual, is bleached linen, and black was from natural sheep. So if you have black in a tapestry in this era, they chose it from black colored sheep. That was the industry standard in the European tapestry world for dyes all the way through the late medieval period. Very, very consistent throughout. And that is part of why the reds and the blues last so long. As we get into the Baroque period of tapestry, when tapestry is being asked to be a flexible painting and therefore they wanted a lot more colors and therefore there were compromises made in the dye process. So many of those have bleached out gray and tan. These Romanesque and high and late medieval pieces retain their color because of the dye technologies and how very stable they were. Amazing. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Is there any chance that you'd be writing a book on this or put this in writing anywhere? That would be so cool. I think the Wise and Foolish Version one wants a book too, or maybe they could be be a pair <laughs> with the Norwegian tapestry thing. If someone knows how to crack that nut, like come bug me. <laughs> It's fun. I, and I love, I get really excited when I'm able to feel like crack the code on something in a way that the present scholarship isn't. And I want to put a shout out to Loran for helping me find materials and students of mine who helped me interpret gigantic texts in Norwegian so I could read them and make sense out of them. And finding that the scholarship is missing big pieces. And part of why they're missing big pieces is they're not weavers. They can't look at a piece and go, oh, you put it that way because you can physically do it that way. 
And therefore, if I look at how you looked at it when you were doing it, ah, now I see it. And being able to cross-disciplinarily look at other art forms within the era and following eras and then trace those, that that's when it gets delicious for me. And I really enjoy um, sharing that with others. You had commented that the white, uh, the, the part of the tapestry that appeared white was actually linen. Could you say just a little bit more about that, uh, the linen in Baldishol Tapestry? Sure. The Baldishol Tapestry has a wool warp, which is very common for tapestry in this era. And it is the only option that has survived this long. Wool is a protein fiber, so it decomposes way less quickly than a plant fiber, which is a carbon fiber. However, white wool does not stay white very well historically. So a lot of the whites in tapestry that are in wool are now some variation of cream because they just don't stay white. All conservatives know that problem. In other parts of Europe, that would tip typically be solved by doing it in silk, which tends to stay whiter a little better than wool does. But it was very unique when I learned, um, and I'm trying to remember where I picked that up. I think it was, there's a website by a group of Norwegian contemporary tapestry weavers and they put out articles, uh, I think it's called Absolute Tapestry. I think it was in one of those articles that stated that the white in the Baldashal is bleached linen. And because of that, it has maintained its brightness. And it literally, like in those Robbie Lafleur images, it's like shining white. And in the class, I was able to procure some bleached French linen that we will use to do the white parts. And it's interesting as you're weaving it to see how different it acts from the wool that you're putting it next to. And it does, it's like it shines. Fascinating, thank you. It was probably a, a less expensive way to get at it than to import silk into Norway at that period. So I think we just have one more clarifying question about the ver. Is it gray squirrel or is it a different animal? It is the European gray squirrel. So just like Ermine is from a weasel, or in its winter form, it's ermine. Uh, Ver is from the gray squirrel. And then there's all kinds of specialized fur names for other, other animals that they were using. And, and they used everything. They used fox. They used wolf. They used bear. They used rabbit. And each one had a different status symbol. Of course, ermine was cream of the crop, right? That's going to be for the king and queen and really high ranking people. Versus there is like, it's a step down, but it's still definitely a status symbol. And if you could afford miniver, which is M-I-N-I-V-E-R, which is supposed to mean mini bear, it's just the belly, then that was even more of a status symbol because it's just the bellies. I, I'm thinking about someone sitting there like stitching squirrel bellies mm -hmm. to make a cloak. <laughs> like the amount of labor that went into everything in this era is just, it will blow you away. But yeah, it was so fun. And the little feet, like they left the little feet. <laughs> we just don't live like that today anymore, do we? But that was part of their world. <laughs> thank you yeah. so much um you are well i just want to say thank you again uh i know that we have the baldashal bird class coming up and unfortunately it's sold out but are you looking at doing I'll another have it again someday yeah. are you looking at researching another tapestry like you have done with the baldashal board or with the wise and foolish versions i'm sure at some point but we'll stick with this one for now and everyone stay tuned for wherever the adventure leads next.